Welcome to TraumaticBrainInjury.com. TraumaticBrainInjury.com is the leading resource on the Internet for resources regarding traumatic brain injury for survivors, families, and caretakers. My name is Stuart Cohen. Today's guest is Dr. David Lenro. Dr. Lenro is a physician who specializes in physical medicine and rehabilitation. He's on staff at the Hospital University of Pennsylvania since 1987, and he's also on the faculty at University of Pennsylvania Medical School. Uh, Dr. Lenro is involved in treating pa uh, patients with traumatic brain injury as a regular part of his practice. Dr. Lenro, thanks for agreeing to appear on TraumaticBrainInjury.com. It's my pleasure. I have some questions for you about the diagnosis and treatment of uh, a brain injury from a physician's perspective. All right? Okay. First of all, is the uh, diagnosis of uh, brain injury usually made at the emergency room immediately after a trauma? It depends on what the trauma is. I mean, some brain injuries are obvious and they're made in the emergency room. Uh, if it's a penetrating injury or depressed skull fracture, those are obvious injuries. Uh, some injuries are less obvious and aren't made till much later. Uh, sometimes not until after the patient's been discharged and had a problem at home. Right, we're going to talk about that in more detail in just a moment. And you've told us elsewhere in other uh, uh, sessions that we've had with you that you categorize brain injury into three categories, mild, moderate, and severe. The moderate and the severe, those are the ones that are being seen in the hospital? Those are the ones that are usually diagnosed in the hospital. And can the moderate ones not be diagnosed in the hospital? In other words, can that diagnosis be missed? in the hospital? Uh, it can be missed, but it should be picked up in the hospital in most patients. Okay. Uh, why is it that sometimes it's difficult to make the diagnosis of a, a moderate traumatic brain injury in the hospital? It depends what the injury is, but some of these patients come into the hospital with multiple injuries. so. They can come into the hospital with multiple fractures, injuries to their chest, life-threatening injuries that are addressed immediately in the hospital. And in treating some of those injuries, it often necessitates that the patient's sedated, they're often on a breathing machine or a ventilator, and the brain injury might be missed because at that point they're addressing these other life-threatening injuries and may not be able to assess how well their brain functions uh, again, unless it's obvious by the mechanism of injury. In layman's terms, the smoke has to clear? Sometimes it does, and, and that's particularly common for the milder brain injuries. Doctor, uh, in other uh, sessions today, you've talked to us about behaviors um, as being one of the ways in which a brain injury will show itself, that uh, the family of the survivor or the survivor, him or herself, is seeing different kinds of behaviors. Um, to the layman, those behaviors might seem like it's some kind of psychological, emotional problem. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. First of all, could you tell us a little bit about these kinds of problems? And then second, I'd like to ask you to tell us whether those problems indeed are psychological. Well. To begin with, I would say that there certainly can be psychological problems with brain injury. There can be depression, there can be other problems that are often seen with brain injuries. But the behaviors that I think you're talking about are problems that occur because of injuries to parts of the brain that generally control those behaviors. So they're organic problems and it's not a psychologic problem. So people can lose their inhibition, they can act inappropriately in social situations, they can be agitated, they can be sexually forward and inappropriate, um, they can say the same word over and over again. There's a, sort of a whole spectrum of abnormal behaviors that occur that aren't um, behavioral or, or psychologic problems, but are organic problems with the brain. And I want to be clear about this. You're saying that, th that these kinds of behaviors can exhibit themselves in patients uh, who have a mild brain injury? So, you, you certainly see some of these problems with mild brain injury. They're often much more subtle than people with more severe brain injuries. 
but they certainly can have behavioral problems. They get irritable. They get frustrated. Uh, they don't they don't think normally or as well as they did before. They can have attention problems and act differently in social situations. And you know we. Just to sort of make this clear, we talk about mild, moderate, and severe injury as sort of an artificial way to separate brain injury, but it's obviously a continuum between all of these um, categories of injury. So, you know, as the mild injury is more of an injury, the symptoms can sort of lean towards the moderate side. Well, uh, I'm getting lost in some of the words, but let me ask you this uh, straight up. Is someone with a mild brain injury can have serious disabling consequences? Yes, absolutely. And uh, how do families deal with this? I mean, if, if I'm a family member and I'm confronted with someone who doesn't remember that I saw them uh, yesterday and the day before and the day before that in the hospital and I come and visit and I'm told, why aren't you visiting me? How do I deal with that? Well, I think it's, it's very difficult for families and, and I think the most important thing is for the family to understand what's going on and that it's not a behavioral problem and that their loved one isn't doing this for either attention or because they're acting out, but that that's, this is truly an organic problem and to understand it's an injury to their head and these behaviors often improve over time as the patient evolves uh, over time. It doesn't always. But I think it's important for families to reach out to resources who can give them information and help them understand what to expect. All right, now, one last section uh, that I want to deal with, uh, with uh, on this subject, Doctor, and that is what family members should expect to see in the hospital over the hospital course with a patient, a family member who has moderate to severe brain injury. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, and I think what they expect and what they'll see will depend on what other injuries the patient happens to have. But for the most part, these patients are either in a car accident, a fall, or sometimes some penetrating trauma, and they're treated for this whole group of injuries, usually in the intensive care unit, usually with multiple IV lines in different parts of their body to give them medications and fluids. These are the tubes. That's right. Uh, and they usually are on a breathing machine, which is either a tube going down their nose or mouth connected to a ventilator or a breathing machine that breathes for them. Uh, and the reason for that can be uh, several fold. One reason is they can't breathe because of other injuries, but also if they have a significant brain injury, it helps decrease the pressure in their brain, so it helps prevent secondary injury. Uh, and for most patients' families, it's not something they're, they're accustomed to seeing, so it's quite shocking. So that means the person is either sedated or just from their injury can't speak or respond. If the injury is severe enough that they have increased pressure in their brain to the point where the physicians think it's doing damage, sometimes they will put monitoring devices into the skull that go either just below the skull or into the brain to monitor pressure and sometimes to let some pressure out. That's fairly typical course what people see initially. Again, depending on the injury, sometimes patients are put into coma to help keep the pressure down in their brain. And assuming there's good progression in the uh, ICU, in the hospital, intensive care unit, and that the patient is ultimately transferred to the regular part of the hospital and the patient improves to the point where they can be uh, discharged to a rehab facility, what should the patients and the patient's family think uh, that they're going to encounter when they get to that rehab facility from a doctor's point of view? Well, I mean, that's, it's a difficult path to describe because every patient's recovery is different. Uh, it, the variability is huge, even with similar injuries. Fair enough. Who on the team of doctors, they're meeting with all these doctors, nurses, discharge planners, uh, how does a family going about figuring out who they should speak to to, follow, to find out uh, what kind of course they're going to be following, following and what kind of needs they're going to have for their family member? 
again, it will depend on the hospital they're in. If it's a, a large tertiary care hospital or a hospital in a big city that has many services, there'll be a discharge planner that should help them or a social worker. They'll most likely see a, a physician from the rehabilitation department in that hospital who can help them with resources and in what to expect in their treatment. That's your job? That is my job, yes. And I, and I think that's very important for patients and their families. And if they're not in a place with those resources, then they should either, either find those resources on their own or have the people at the hospital direct them to local resources for brain injury. Thank you. And I'd like to mention once again before we end the session that uh, at traumaticbraininjury.com we do have a list of, uh, of resources which will uh, help and act as a, a starting point for family members and survivors. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you.